I think maybe we're going across. Um, I see us making our way into the internets. So I think we have been some level of successful. Um, and so that's excellent. Shane, how are you doing today? Well, you know what? <clears throat> I am of mixed emotions because on the other hand, as many people have acknowledged, I'm not sure any of us really wanted one more extra hour of 2020. On the other hand, my favorite day of the year is the day that we get the extra hour of sleep. And so I still am going to be a cup half full rather than cup half empty guy and say that because we had our extra hour of sleep last night, I am superb. Awesome. And you, my friend. I'm doing really good. Um, we had, um, I think... We may have peaked at number of visitors in our uh, in-person assembly this morning. Oh, wonderful. Uh, and so that's really a, a good blessing. Um, and that was a, a wonderful time of assembly together. Uh, so there's that plus. Um, I think we were able to encourage each other. Uh, we had some people who are traveling. And so the visitors kind of balanced the, uh, the space out uh, pretty well. So, um, you know, those, 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 those assembly times together have been great. Um, yeah. So as we kind of settle in for th folks who are continuing to participate with us in these studies, um, we are near the end of our journey to know God better, to understand the person uh, of God, our relationship to God. And we're going to be looking at a ancient analogy for the Trinity shortly. But before we do that at the top of the hour, Shane, I, I understand you have a question to ask for me this afternoon. Yes, I do. And this stems from a vicious debate my nine-year-old niece and I have been having. It's been raging for two weeks now. Mm. And that has to do with favorite Halloween candy. Mm. So I would like to ask you, Brother Martin, what is your favorite Halloween candy? That's a complicated question because I have a, a deep challenge with all candy. I love all of it for the most part. Certainly. I can tell you in some ways what the worst candy is. And those are carnival peanuts. <laughs> oh, um, yes. Like, yeah, those are terrible. <laughs> uh, like I, I can clearly identify that. I do not agree with some of your comments about sweet tarts. Oh, come on. Um, yeah. That's heresy. No. Uh, you're, you're, you're diving deep into my childhood and ripping out its bones. <laughs> um, good afternoon to the olden caps are joining with us. Uh, and then on the upside, I really... Um, I got to tell you, I love uh, Reese's um, peanut butter pumpkins. Um, wow. I love Reese's cups, uh, but peanut butter pumpkins in the Halloween season right now uh, have kind of risen to the top uh, of my, I really like it. Uh, they very well may make an appearance on the schmo tonight though, making the hot schmores. Oh, so, very um, nice. What about very you? What, what's, your, what's your answer to this conflict? Oh, my favorite is uh, Twix. I mean, it's a candy and a cookie. So to combine together, how can that not be the greatest thing ever? And my niece, who's nine years old, says, and I quote, I don't like the texture. So my nine-year-old niece is already making uh, decisions about texture with candy. So uh, she has the advanced and eloquent palate, and you should <laughs> listen to her. <laughs> <laughs> but we've had uh, we've had a pretty good and tragically yesterday I uh, I did a grocery order by pickup and I had ordered the candy to, to pass out last night and I thought I made sure to order the bags they represented that had Twix in them but alas when I got home I was without Twix so this was a bummer of a bummer of a Halloween for sure. As I often say, that sounds more of a you problem than a me problem. So it's time for us to get into our conversation of the hour. Um, so as we've kind of foretold and we kind of hinted at at the close of our last study, we're going to be looking at an ancient illustration for the Trinity um, to solve. It's like the one illustration to rule them all, if you will, um, for those who are aware. Uh, but before we do that, Shane, if you could, could you lead us in prayer to start our study together? Yes. Father, we do thank you for uh, the joy that we share together as your people and through our relationship with you. And we pray that you would bless us and guide us in, in our study and help us, Father, to, um, to appreciate and to embrace the eternal love that we come to know, uh, that we come to know through you and in your son. We pray in his name. Amen. 
All right, so we are going to at least put a capstone on this part of our conversation uh, and really try to deal with complicated imagery in the Bible about the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and our own perception of those relationships, at least in a most simplified way. And so without any more unclear comments uh, from me, Shane, why don't you set up the analogy that will illustrate this relationship for us? Sure. So uh, we know that what we're talking about is a doctrine that says that there is one God and that the one God is the Father, Son, and Spirit. And last week we talked about different analogies or illustrations that, as all illustrations are, are going to break down at some point, but some that particularly break down and they do maybe a slightly good job in representing the oneness of God, but the threeness of Father, Son, and Spirit. But they, but they do also a bad job in one of those, those areas as well. And of course, uh, a lot of what the root of the problem is with a lot of the illustrations you see, like the, the egg or ice, water, and uh, 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 air, air or uh, the shamrock, I've seen that. All of these are material objects. <clears throat> and God in his nature is not that kind of object. So that's part of what really limits us here. So... What we're trying to illustrate is um, a way to convey the image of the eternal God as Father, Son, and Spirit, but that avoids some of the challenges that are presented by material or physical objects. Well, um, ancient thinkers in uh, the history of, of people thinking about this kind of thing came up with an illustration that is not going to be perfect either. So we should be humble and modest and acknowledge that. But what they wanted to do is pick up off of the language of scripture, uh, an analogy that is not something that involves material objects, but something that is instead uh, non-physical or immaterial as a way to convey the relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And so they picked up on the language of sonship and of the Spirit, a son who is from his father, and spirit, which in Hebrew and Greek and Latin, even all those languages is the same basic word that can also be air or, or wind. And so they wanted to pick up off of language that talks about the sun, a begetting of the sun and a breathing of the spirit. And essentially, if uh, the father, son and spirit are all God and God is eternal, then that relationship of begetting and breathing must also be eternal. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to find a way to illustrate what would it be to have an eternally begotten son and an eternally breathed spirit. And that's what these uh, illustrations are really designed to do. And in all of that stuff, it, it's really kind of trying to figure out a way again to grapple on the complexity. Um, every illustration, every analogy is only going to go as far as the text itself goes. Uh, I think that's an important concept. Remember, even with some of the lesser ones, the ones that we might uh, poke um, as saying, well, that's not really the best illustration because it doesn't go far enough or it goes way too far. Um, you're still kind of bound to the text itself. Uh, and so I think that's a big goal in understanding them. Um, so um, we've got some key Bible terms that will kind of help us work our way into it to, to understand. And, the, and one of the first ones you've identified uh, is the biblical term proceed. Um, and so kind of explain that a little bit from a language standpoint, and then we're going to look at it in context of the various texts where it shows up. Sure. That's exactly right. Well, um, the scriptures talk about the son proceeding from the father, like in John eight forty two. And the spirit proceeding from the father in John 15, 26. And so based on that kind of language, um, the idea is this, that is there any kind of procession we can think of that is not like a procession of physical objects? So like, for example, um, you know, here before too long, it's going to be time for the Macy's Day uh, Thanksgiving Day Parade. And there's going to be a long, well, I don't know if there is now because of all the COVID stuff, but under normal circumstances, there'd be a long procession of floats and things like that 
uh, going down through the city of New York. So that's a procession, but it's like a funeral procession. You know, it's cars, floats, etc. It's a procession of material objects leaving one place and going to another. But remember that what <clears throat> these people are trying to think of is a way to illustrate the Father, Son, and Spirit in a non-material way. So they started to imagine, is there any kind of procession, something proceeds from something else that doesn't involve a physical object? And they thought, aha, we can think of a couple of these. First of all, within us as human beings, we have a mind. Now, the mind uses the brain and the senses, but we believe that there's more to us than just the, the physical object of the brain. We have a mind, and from that mind can come forth or proceed forth thoughts. Though that is a procession that you might say is internal to us. Like very often when I'm talking and I look at Philip, I know that there are thoughts proceeding from his mind, but they are internal to him. I have no idea what he's thinking. He might be looking up football scores for his say, fantasy football team right now. I, I, until he tells me, and that procession does become external, like he communicates it, all I know is those thoughts are internally proceeding from his mind. And then <clears throat> another kind of procession that we have is we have a heart or a will, you might say. And from that heart or will can come forth love proceeds forth love, though again, until it is expressed, it would sort of remain in. Like you, you feel love welling up in you and coming forth inside of you, but then you may uh, display it to, to somebody else. So putting all of that together, we're trying to think of ways to communicate how the Son and the Spirit eternally uh, are begotten of God and breathed forth by God. And we're trying to think of a, a way to illustrate that in, that is non-material. And so uh, picking up on the language of procession then, this line of thought started to develop, to think about the sun in terms of the procession of a thought from a mind and the spirit in terms of procession of love from, from the heart. Well, yeah, and if you look through the scriptures themselves, you're going to find a, in a non-pun attempt, a series of uses of this image. Uh, it appears in Isaiah two or three times. It certainly appears in the text of Revelation. You could argue it appears in the text of Hebrews. Um, it definitely appears in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians as a way in which um, Paul is trying to teach Gentile converts about the way in which their relationship is seen in Christ and how Christ himself uh, is kind of the, the harbinger of whom they are. Uh, and so it's not an unfamiliar illustration, even though it might be at times for us uh, of this yeah. idea of a eternal procession. Yeah, um, that's right. I remember when I first encountered this, I mean, you know, I'm 53 years old and I've been trying to study the Bible and, and also read ideas that other people have had and evaluate them for a very long time. But it was only until about four years ago that I actually started to dive into some of these older ideas that they're not better because they're older, but they're not worse because they're older either. And sometimes they have um, a little bit of a, uh, a weight to them that I, I think uh, has some, some benefit to consider. So if you wouldn't mind, Philip, could we go to John 1 a minute and just yeah, talk yeah. about that with relation to the son and the father? So we all know that in John chapter 1 and verse 1, we already have in the very first verse, uh, the, the basic puzzle pieces of the Trinity right before us in the sense that we have a statement that says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So on the one hand, the word is identical to God. The word was God. But on the other hand, the word is in a relationship with God. The word was with God. And that's really what we're talking about here. At the end of the day, to talk about the Trinity just means that the Father and the Son are with each other. The Father and the Son and the Spirit are with each other, but they are distinct and yet identical and in a relationship. So how do we make sense of that? So that's what we're talking about. But, you know, think about this description here, uh, the use of the term the word. I mean, we all know that uh, the term here in Greek is logos. And we know that that means more than just simply a word on a page. 
it means like a, a thought, a whole thought of a subject, like uh, theology, uh, biology, geology, etc. And so the concept of logos, um, a thought that is conceived by a mind, generated by a mind, is uh, is at the heart of just this this passage here. So the the idea would kind of be like this: if I ask everybody who's listening to take a moment and just conceive conceive of yourself, think about yourself. Now, here's where it breaks down because we're limited, because we're finite, because our thoughts are very fragmented and scattered, mine particularly are, our thoughts of ourselves are gonna be very partial and very fragmentary, very limited. But with a little bit of imagination, we can conceive of a mind contemplating itself and imagine having the ability to do so perfectly and the ability to do so eternally. And it would be an eternal thought conceived by a mind that perfectly captures what that mind is. And that would be the idea here of the relationship of the son coming from the father and yet identical to the father. And in fact, I've even used the word conceive. Isn't it interesting that we use that terminology to describe reproduction of children, they're conceived, there's conception, but then also conceiving thoughts. Thoughts are concepts that we conceive. That's the conception of an idea. So you can see why a lot of Christians through the years have thought this is a not so bad way to illustrate the relationship of the father and the son. It would be kind of like the procession of a thought from a mind, but that thought is as eternal as the mind and it perfectly captures the mind. So that would be the idea. Yeah, and I think with the, with the concept kind of being built out or reconsidered, um, that it, this kind of helps us see the intermeshing aspect of relationship. Um, many of the analogies that are modern analogies, even ones that you or I may have used at times, um, tend to oversimplify the edge space. Mm -hmm. um, because we, we really want for various theological or understanding issues at times to limit God to he does these things and mm -hmm. Jesus does these things and the spirit does these things. When textually, when we read through the context of the prophets and the context of the New Testament as an illustration, we see God the Father interacting in many of the same ways that God the Spirit or God the Son interact with um, in that commonality then ties them together rather than saying their roles now force them to not serve in these other areas. Mm -hmm. um, a key example of that comes from the text of Romans in chapter 8 where um, both the spirit and the son are textually cited as in various ways interceding on behalf yeah. of the saints. Um, and so does that mean that the spirit is, or Jesus, like, okay, wait a minute, because I thought they can only do one thing. Well, no, they're both doing it, right. um, and they often overlap. Right. Yeah, we'll especially talk about that more next week. Mm -hmm. The more I have mulled over this analogy, like I say, we understand that it's not perfect, but it sure does seem to make sense of a lot of passages that on the one hand talk about uh, the son as identical to the father and yet coming from the father. And in the notes, I have listed several passages like this, like Hebrews 1, 3 says that he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And Philippians 2, 6 says he is in the form of God. Colossians 1, 15, he is the image of the invisible God. And so I, I love I, I love this analogy from the standpoint that it secures the identity of father and son. And in fact, uh, in mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis makes a big point about this, that the difference between someone who makes something and a father who begets something is, um, I mean, I can't make anything. I mean, like I could make, uh, you know, supper, but uh, let's suppose I could theoretically build something. It's what well, I build it, I make it, but it's not going to be the same kind of thing as me. But a father begets a son because like begets like. And, and so when you take this language, it helps us to see a relationship in which the son is eternally from the father 
but he is begotten. He is the, like begets like he is what the father is. Jesus can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Or John says in John 1, 18, that the word has explained him. You know, he, and so I really like that a lot. The key error to avoid here in the father-son language of the Bible is just to make sure we understand the point is not that the father was around for a gazillion years and then said, no, I think I'll have a son now. That, that's not it. Uh, it's that the father eternally begets the son. And I was really excited, Philip, after I initially started reading some of this, but I hadn't talked about it a lot. And I was really excited one day in our worship service, we have a member, uh, Brother Jay Robbins, who is, uh, he's a UPS delivery driver, truck driver. But one morning he led a prayer and he, it was one of the most theologically astute prayers I've ever heard. He, it was something along the lines of, Father, we thank you for a son, a son unlike any other son, a son who is the same age as the father. And I thought, man, that is, a, that is exactly it, eternal with, with the father. So, so that would be the idea of this analogy of as a thought proceeds from the mind, the son eternally is begotten of the father, but is the perfect encapsulation or conception um, of the father. Right. And I think another way of your struggle, it goes, as I struggle to, to put these pieces together, is to think about he hasn't ceased proceeding from the sun. Yeah. And so if you were to draw this out for those who are visually minded, the word procession um, is overlapping both the current space, the present space, and the future space of each of these ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's not procession in the sense of um, our earthly ideas of sonship, which are limited to my son wasn't and now he is. Right. Um, that's exactly right. Uh, I think that's an important kind of thing. That, like, okay, now I got to fit that in my head. Like I can see that, but now it has to fit in my space and, to, and kind of think about it and realize Jesus is different. And that's a fundamental truth about whom he is. Yeah. Um, when we add the next phase of this, which is to, to bring the, the full Trinity together in concept, um, I also think it's important to do what we do with Jesus, the son of a carpenter who is also the anointed, is to identify the reality that because the word that is translated spirit um, has a wider use range than just the spirit. Mm -hmm. I, I always include this. Be cautious to how you read a text. Even when great translations who are excellent translators have done the work of suggesting right. capitalization choices, because that's a very common way to identify it. Sometimes they'll include other markers. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that even capitalized spirit then becomes the spirit of God um, until we do the individual work to understand it too. Just because it's translated that way doesn't mean that we just oh, blindly accept it. Uh, and so even with this procession model, caution applies to make sure we really understand the whole God whom we, we serve because the spirit deserves its proper place. Yeah, no, I think that that, that, is, that is exactly right. And, um, <clears throat> and to just keep that kind of analogy going, um, if you think of the, the sun as comparable to um, uh, the, the thought proceeding forth from the mind being eternally conceived, um, then if you take your cue from the language of the spirit as, uh, you know, in Greek, it's the word pneuma, like where we get pneumatic and pneumonia and all that kind of stuff, then it would be a, a, a breathing that is eternal, just like the begetting is eternal. And so it would be an eternal breathing forth of the spirit. And uh, we have another procession, so to speak, within us, and that is uh, of the procession of love from the heart or from the will. And so uh, a lot of uh, thinkers through the years have picked up on the fact that frequently in Scripture, the Holy Spirit is described in terms of a gift, uh, like uh, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
um, or uh, Romans 5, verse 5, hope does not put to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so they would connect that idea of a gift given by love with the procession of love and say, here's a way to maybe illustrate, not perfectly, but illustrate the spirit. It's just like the love that proceeds forth from a heart or a will. Um, The spirit proceeds forth um, from God. And when you think about all of the passages that make those connections with the spirit and a gift that's given or love, um, then you can see that it's... uh, I think I, I can't remember if I've said this or not before, Philip. I said it in the college class a few weeks ago. It's kind of like in the movie I was named after, uh, which is Shane, the cowboy movie. And there's a point in the movie in which the little kid asks Shane why he only wears one one gun and, and handles it the way that he does. And he says, well, it's as good as any and better than most. And I always think that now when I read about this analogy, <clears throat> it's not perfect. But it sure is as good as any I've ever come across. And I think it's better than most uh, in a lot of ways in securing, again, the uh, oneness of God, but the threeness of Father, Son, and Spirit, and their eternal relationship uh, with each other. Yeah, and I think it helps us kind of get um, a handle on parts of it. Now, with that said, like, um, and I think we've talked about this already a couple times earlier, What we're trying to do, again, is provide a framework for the text itself to deal with what is a more complicated relationship than the simple way that we can sometimes boil the text down to. Um, So thinking again now to the the big picture, we've got a couple passages, too, that talk about this relationship. We might get to those in a second. We've now created a model that, that really extended has the son proceeding forth from the father now the spirit proceeds forth in the same way um not like oh one day i need a spirit boom here's one and he's going to do some stuff for me right it's overlaid with that same past present future look at thing and eternally in procession uh that means it was it is and it will be Uh, and so they're all layered together in that same concept And next week, if the Lord wills, what we'll talk about is how this um, eternal relationship of begetting and breathing then enters into time and space and interacts with us. And so sometimes the word that's used for this to distinguish procession from this is mission. So there is procession eternally. The Father eternally begets the Son. The Father eternally breathes out the Spirit. But then there is the sending forth of the Son in the Incarnation. You know, the Word becomes flesh. And then there is the outpouring of the Spirit, the mission of the Spirit, like we see on the day of Pentecost and so forth. But um, those missions of the Son and the Spirit are then a reflection in time of that deeper relationship that has existed from all eternity. Um, The Son takes upon himself humanity to be born in this world, reflecting his eternal begottenness. And the spirit is a gift in time and space, reflecting his eternally being given uh, by love. And I think, uh, you know, um, that's really another advantage to me of of this uh, line of approach to all of this. It's using biblical language, it's using the biblical pictures, and it's using the biblical terminologies. And it helps us to see the connection between God in eternity and what God is like, and then God as he comes into history. And we've talked about this before. Really, we only even know about the Trinity because of the revelation of the Son and the Spirit in time and space. That's how we came to know this. So uh, that ties it in together with the, the mystery passages of the New Testament, that, you know, what God has now revealed that has not been revealed. So there really is, to me, um, uh, a lot of advantage to it. It is an analogy. We, we talked, the, by the way, I should, should mention one of the reasons that in the early part of this study, I kept hammering home the point, our language about God will always be sort of like and never exactly like, was all for this lesson, these lessons here uh, on the Trinity, because uh, this is especially what tests the limits of our language. Right, because, and you've got a key takeaway for us, and I'll kind of state real quick, that God is personal, relational, and loving in a way that exceeds our comprehension. Um, 
I think it's important to put, put in mind when we're trying to do something that's difficult for 21st century disciples. Uh, and I say that because it, the Bible language, the imagery language of the Bible is like a foreign language to 21st century disciples. Mm -hmm. um, we are very far removed from the visual data banks of the Hebrews and the visual data banks of the Greeks and the Romans and the nations around them. And so when the Bible uses uh, teaching models like breathes out, um, we don't necessarily connect quickly with it. And so yeah. we've got to take the time, do the work to understand these things so that we get a better complex but holistic view of whom God is. Yeah. Now you've been, am I remembering right? So are you teaching Galatians right now? Correct. Uh, okay. Galatians is actually part of, um, for 2020, for the Church of the East Side, we've been doing a um, expository series through Galatians. We've got two more um, lessons to do for the year to complete the sixth chapter. Right. Well, why don't we loop back in then a passage that we brought up a few weeks ago, <clears throat> but really will uh, encapsulate exactly what you just said. I, I think it's such a beautiful passage in Galatians chapter four. Uh, listen to this language in light of what we have talked about uh, today. So Galatians 4, 4, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you're sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And, you know, <clears throat> it's really hard to overemphasize that concluding point that the Christian view of God is fundamentally different, certainly from Islam <clears throat> and even, <clears throat> excuse me, even from Judaism in the sense that, well, in Judaism, the God is referred to as father. And there is, I think, one reference in the Psalms that describes him as father. God is never prayed to in the Old Testament as father ever. Mm -hmm. And yet in Christianity, that is the characteristic way that we pray. Well, there's no accident, no mystery as to why that is the case. It's precisely because of all that we've been talking about today and the last couple of weeks. It is the doctrine that God is eternally Father, Son, and Spirit in this relationship of love that opens the door up for us to pray as we do because of our relationship. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here in, in this passage. I think a lot of us have been more, quote-unquote, Trinitarian than we ever realized. We already believe all these passages. We just maybe had never like, you know, collated them together in this certain way. Well, and um, admittedly, this is also a subject that requires you to stop and think, um, and it makes it more difficult to kind of process. Uh, and so that makes teaching it more difficult, which makes retaining it more difficult, which makes learning it the second time more difficult. I mean, it just, yeah. it, it, it does fall into the deeper, weightier aspects of the theological side of Bible mm -hmm. study. Yeah. Um, with that being said, um, we've got a couple more lessons coming up in our conversation about God. I think two more uh, planned discussions uh, will be next Sunday and the Sunday after, Lord willing. And maybe we'll have a surprise guest appearance for one of those. So we'll see uh, uh, if the paperwork can be done and the office <laughs> will show up just fine. Um, but that should be exciting. Um, but I uh, want to thank everyone for being part of the study today. Um, hopefully um, everyone will enjoy it. Uh, unless Shane has an additional sign off, I'm going to dismiss us in prayer in just a second. Um, as I do that, I want to be praying for a friend of mine, by the way, uh, he's fine, but he didn't have an accident with a chainsaw this week. Uh, and so um, uh, it's fair if you know who he is to make fun of him. Because uh, I will be doing that, but we do want to pray for him to get better. He's not significantly hurt. Uh, it's mainly his pride. Um, but um, um, let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the blessings that it is to approach your throne of grace and mercy. As disciples of the Son, um, we ask that you listen to our prayer. And whatever we ask of you, we know that you will work within the spaces of our heart with the Spirit to grant what is best to glorify and what best to honor the Son and you and the Spirit and will allow us to be good servants. Watch over the souls of many who are strained and pulled in various directions, particularly first we ask for those who serve as uh, leaders in their local churches, um, give them wisdom 
and space to think through the challenges of each day. To those who serve in those congregations, um, provide for them opportunity to do well and the resources and support to be successful. And to all of us who are part of the household and flock of God, give us um, the willingness to follow the chief shepherd. We ask prayers for those who have been hurt, especially for my friend Adam as he recovers from his injury. Uh, we pray that uh, whatever takes place will uh, be to his betterment and that not only good medical care, but whatever hand that you can provide will be good. To the other families we know that have been struggling with physical illness, with spiritual trials, uh, please comfort them as well. And this is our prayer in your son's name. Amen. Amen.